Greetings collectors and welcome to today's retro game review. Now who wants to see something really scary? Yes, today we travel back to an age where computer games were distributed in a way that must seem quite frankly unbelievable to anyone born past the early 1980s. Forget your digital downloads, your CDs, your discs, your cartridges and cassettes. It's time to go old school with good old fashioned paper distribution. Join me today as we take a terrifying look back at the way things were in 1983. I of course refer to the book, Usborne's Creepy Computer Games. Now to be fair, in 1983 we were all happily using cassette tapes and cartridges of various sorts, with floppy disks also gaining popularity. None of these would be particularly unusual in the home. However, the early 1980s was a time when programs could be small enough to simply distribute via the written word. Sound silly? Well, not really. Back in the day, popular micro-magazines would often publish code for micro-enthusiasts to type in at home. You would often get a cut-out cover to add those finishing touches. You not only got a small piece of game software, but also learnt the fundamentals of programming at the same time. It was an era where being IT literate meant something other than can you use a Windows based PC. Being IT literate was almost a byphrase for can you code. These were the days when computing was very much a specialist hobby. Of course you would need some hardware to get you up and running. The early 80s, at least here in the UK, was dominated by microcomputers. Think of machines such as the Sinclair Spectrum, the very British black box of the working man. The Commodore 64, one of the most popular micros of the day due to its vast library and add-on capabilities, built in good old Britain and over in West Germany. If you wanted to be a Welsh patriot though, the Dragon 32 was perhaps your weapon of choice. Amongst these popular options sat the BBC Micro, developed by Acorn as part of an initiative from the British government and supported by the BBC. Essentially, it was the successor to the Acorn Electron. By the late 1970s, it had become clear that the British education system would potentially fall behind other developed nations and needed to act when it came to IT skills. Computing as it stood was very much a specialist venture by the late 1970s. A national plan was needed to get us coding and prepared for the world of tomorrow. This became known as the Computer Literacy Project and supported not only on television programs, but also BBC microcomputers placed in British schools under government funding. My school had precisely one of these machines and precisely zero staff that knew how to use it. Even up until the year 1999, I still remember one of these sitting in the corner, shunned by the Windows 3.1 machines. Yes, my school really was still using Windows 3.1 in 1999. There was even a joke at our school after it was burgled. It went something like this. They stole everything but the computers. As a side note, we still had a suite of 386RM Nimbuses running in the year 2000. Yeah, ask your parents about those. I really shouldn't laugh though, as it was in this time that I learnt a lot of my coding skills. Anyway, the Spectrum, the Commodore 64, the Dragon 32, the Oric, the BBC Micro, and all of the other Micros they had something in common. Basic. No, not that they were basic, but the computer language, BASIC. Developed in 1964, BASIC is actually an acronym. Beginners All Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. True story. For those getting into coding, this is perhaps one of the first languages you would have been introduced to and mastered. The adoption of BASIC across multiple systems was a key turning point in programming. This somewhat standardised language enabled the learning of programming to flourish during these years. Sure, Sinclair BASIC is a little different to Commodore BASIC, and BBC BASIC is a little different again. However, they are all dialects of the same computing language. If you learnt one, then transitioning to another was not too much of a stretch. And that in fact is tied up with the third problem, um, which is that there are different forms of BASIC um, on each computer. It's a terrible problem with, with microcomputers, all the different forms of BASIC. And for instance, we've got on the Apple about a hundred odd commands here, 75 different BASIC commands on the VIC-20 and 150 something like that on the BBC. And clearly if you use those commands uh, from, on different machines, the program won't work. So 
basic code takes a really sort of a hatchet job on this. It simply says, well, we'll let you use 50 commands and no more. And, um, so it's rather like a basic... Now I'm on the cusp of my 40s and rather battle-hardened by life. A stock basic manual holds little fear for me. OK, the schematic workings of the BBC Micro and assembly language still give me sweaty palms, but the basic coding manuals? They're pretty decent to follow. Shows such as BBC Micro Live were great for adults and enthusiasts, but what about the children? Won't somebody think of the children? You list your one, um, and I'll list the top of my programme here. And if we look on your screen, you can see at line 200, yes, 200 there. If peak 49152, and so on. Now, on the Apple, that is looking at the keyboard. Um, if we look at the, the same thing on here, line 200, we've got on the BBC, um, in key string. Now, the idea here is that the programme, which of course follows further down in the listing, can go sub 200, that is call at the subroutine at line 200. When it gets Imagine you're eight years old. Computing doesn't exactly look exciting now, does it? But wait. And this is where the Usborne book series comes in. With the drive for IT literacy in our schools, there was a natural gap to fill. Creepy computer games, take my pocket money, just 99p. All of a sudden, you'll want to become a coder of the next video game nasty. That cover, just awesome. It really has stood the test of time well, as have so many of the Usborne book series. Usborne published dozens of educational children's books, from machine code for beginners to computer controlled robots, practice your basic, and even experiments with your computer. Usborne really didn't dumb things down. There was a strong ethic of teaching real skills in a manageable way for children. I look at the current state of education and wonder if this latest generation could handle a book like Machine Code for Beginners. Anyway, that's just me getting old, I guess. The range of books that I'm looking at here, though, are the ones aimed at letting the user create a game with the help of the book. Be it computer spy games, fantasy games, space games, or even adventure games. The cross-platform use of BASIC meant that publishers such as Usborne could produce one book catering for multiple machines. In the case of creepy computer games, the Sinclair ZX81, BBC Micro, Oric, TRS-80, Apple and Dragon32. A bonus internet point if you've ever used a TRS-80, or any of the other Tandy computers for that matter. It wasn't long before Usborne really cornered the market when it came to children's IT educational material. And before you assume that Usborne are an evil corporation exploiting children and the market, think again. Peter Osborne is still a managing director at the company, along with his daughter Nicole, as deputy managing director. Honestly, have a look around their site. They truly are a breath of fresh air, and it's clear that creativity and integrity are at the forefront of what they do. And you'll find something else at their website for yourself too. The series of programming books for children from the 1980s. The Usborne family have now made them freely available in PDF format via the website. If you're curious about getting children started on coding old machines, then this is the perfect place. To put this into perspective, if you must own the physical copy like myself, I've seen this book priced at 50 British pounds on the online auctions, although recent top bids have only hit 20 pounds. Still, that's a lot for a relatively short children's coding book. The Fantasy Games edition? Now that's going to sting. So, creepy computer games. Well, I have to say that this is the one that appealed to me most. Inside, you'll be able to code out eight horror-themed programs, and I use the term horror lightly. In reality, they are mostly logic games with a bit of a theme wrapped around them. The format of the book is, as you would imagine, very accessible to new coders. Since the basic code covers multiple machines, there is a key where code deviates. See here the star for BBC Micros and the circle for Apple machines. If we hop into a bit of the code example here, you'll see where code may deviate in a minor way, usually by a single piece of formatting. In cases where there are more major deviations in the basic execution between hardware, there will be a helpful piece of substitute code provided. Ah, ZX81, you and your crazy dialect. What's nice is that you'll also feel connected to the code. Let's face it, just retyping code isn't exactly fun. You'll want to know what's going on. 
Here's where the book really excels in my opinion. Take this example from the first game, Computer Nightmare. You're told that this line sets a score, whilst the let command is defining a stored string. Already you'll be feeling like a coder. What I like here is that the learning isn't dumbed down for children. This is a legitimately effective way of imparting knowledge. The explanations continue and go that step further in suggesting modifications to the code, such as changing the speed variables. We've now gone beyond the basic code and into a deeper understanding. There's then a gentle prompt to ask the coder how they would produce letters rather than numbers. In swift succession, we've gone from example code, to modifications, to problem solving, all with the skills we've just picked up. It's all seamless learning and I have to say that I wish that modern training books were this helpful. To still appeal to children, the book does feature some great illustrations. I really enjoy the number wizard, but it's the Spider Woman illustration that really stands out here for me. It's all so well polished and memorable. As you might expect, the games themselves are a bit of a mixed bag. The first game, Computer Nightmare, only has 30 lines of code, so you can understand the limitations here. It's also worth me stating here that I will be showing footage from the ZX81 output throughout, as it's the default code used within the book. The Sinclair Spectrum range was well established and mainstream here in the UK, however only minor coding changes are needed to run on other platforms. I won't run through all of the games here in this episode, but I will instead give you a good flavour. Ghost Maze pits you against, you guessed it, a maze, with ghosts in it, your aim being to find the exit. You can move forward, turn left and right. This is actually a rather nifty bit of code, as turning left or right will pivot the map. Landing on a ghost will transport you elsewhere. Yes, it's simple, but my goodness, you can learn a lot from 95 lines of code. It really will get you familiar with your ifs, lets, go-tos, prints and for loops. So things ramp up a level here with the game Seance. Now imagine in this day and age giving a virtual seance game to children to program, but here we are. Essentially the spirits want you to remember the letters that they are spelling out, or as the book says, they will be angry, very angry. Well okay then. It's a simple game, but again it has a certain creepiness to it and even introduces subroutines. There's also some rather chilling messages should you upset the spirits. I've updated my code for the modern age. Perhaps the best game in the book is Gravedigger, standing at 131 lines of code. Your task is to escape the graveyard as you're chased by three skeletons. These are indicated by the X's. You are represented by the asterisk and the gravestones by the crosses. It's a simple turn-based affair in which you can move in the cardinal directions, but also have the option to dig a hole to block the skeletons. All in all, a great little game for what it is. Minimal, but it does feel like a real game. It also has some exceptional graphics for the day. Look closely at this pixel here, right in here between the gravedigger and the skeleton. Okay, so that isn't in the game, but it was in our minds as children. Of course, what the Usborne books did for my generation was to very much act as a gateway drug onto harder stuff, onto more spectrum game programming, writing out peaks and pokes. Before you knew it, we were a generation shooting up on Class A material, always looking for that next coding fix. This is an urgent appeal for coding awareness. Every year, thousands of lives are ruined by the programming bug. This woman can't stop thinking about that go-to statement she wrote last week. Would a do-while loop have been sufficient? Her husband certainly thinks so. This man could only afford the 16k RAM edition of the Sinclair Spectrum. He needs the 48k expanded RAM edition to make that Pac-Man clone he so desperately dreams of. Karen took up Python at just age 15. She now wanders the world as an empty shell, confused as to why all tasks can't be scripted. Jonathan, not his real name, took up Perl programming after his father left his laptop open one night, only for it to be discontinued in 2015. He now spends his days telling people he's a game maker, 
he's yet to publish anything other than a failed Kickstarter project. This poor man got hooked on JavaScript at just age 12. Now he spends his days making JavaScript games for corporate websites. He feels dead inside. Please, think before you get into programming. As the technology advanced, the children of the 80s became the programmers of the 90s and beyond. What the Usborne coding books did for us was to create an easy to pick up experience and begin our coding journey. They weren't the dry manuals that were seen as the go-to media of the day. They weren't the more adult focused educational programs that simply looked to educate rather than also entertain us. They were for children written by people that actually cared and understood how to bring coding alive. Have a virtual seance? Why not? Modify the code? Why not? It was all so accessible and interesting, and that's the real triumph of this book series. It's an educational tool that works, whilst also appealing to our sense of intrigue for the horror and mystery genre. Now, I accept that this is perhaps quite an unusual topic for a Halloween episode, but I would urge anyone with an interest in coding to give this book a chance. Until next time, happy gaming and happy hauntings. <laughs>